Hey guys, this is my weird ass intro because when I started editing this video, I realized that something happened with my microphone and I didn't have sound for the first like two minutes. So my whole intro was scrapped. So here's me redoing it. <laughs> this week's case is about a disturbing relationship, bad parenting, and resulted in a murder. So let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Brandy, and it's time for a true crime case, mystery, or paranormal story with one or more of my fabulous felines, which will be in the next cut, not this one, sorry. If you're a returning subscriber, welcome back, my feline friends, and a big shout out to my feline fans for helping support this channel. Thank you for being patient with me on these videos. I will be honest, I have been thinking about the future of this channel and where it would go if it continues. Please know that I have decided to continue. Um, it'll probably be still on the every two week schedule uh, because I do like interacting with you guys and I don't want to lose that. So this channel will continue for now. So before we begin on this case, um, just so you know, we are going to be talking about incest and the death of a two week old baby. So you may want to skip this video if you are not in the right mind for it or it's triggering or because it's the Christmas holiday and you don't want to ruin your spirit. <laughs> I did have another case picked out that was a little more lighthearted, but um, that was part of the issue why I didn't get a video out last week as well is because another YouTuber actually did the case and I, you know, they did a wonderful, wonderful job on it and it's hard to follow that, especially when they're a bigger YouTuber. So I thought I will save this case for later on and I randomly picked this case out of my case list and then realized how dark it was. <laughs> so I'm sorry, but here we are. Uh, so um, let's get back to the other video. Okay, <sighs> where to start on this case? <laughs> It's a doozy, guys. There's a lot of moving parts. Let's just start with the two at the center of this case. They're the, the parents of this baby, okay? The parents in this case were named Christopher McNabb and Courtney Bell. This couple uh, had two children together. They had a two-year-old named Clarissa and the two-week-old baby named Kalia. The relationship between Chris and Courtney was pretty toxic. There was a lot of domestic abuse issues. Chris cheated on Courtney all the time. But the probably most controversial issue is that these two were first cousins. Now, they didn't know that they were first cousins when they started dating, but they would know after they started dating, somebody told them, and uh, apparently they just chose to stay together anyway. So let's dive into some history first. So let's start with the father, Christopher McNabb, and I'll just call him Chris because that's what he went by. <clears throat> Chris was born in 1990, and his mother had walked out on him as a baby, or very early age at least. So he was raised by his father, and then his father would get remarried, so he was raised by his father and his new stepmother. Chris's dad was named Michael McNabb. Michael, you know, did his best to make sure that his child had a good childhood. I mean, the family was pretty stable. Michael worked very hard, and, you know, Chris never went hungry. Now, when Chris got into his teens, he fell with a bad crowd, and he started causing all sorts of trouble. Chris became very disobedient, and he pretty much figured that the rules didn't apply to him. Chris first got in trouble with the law at age 14, and by age 15, he started running away from home and stealing anything that he could get his hands on. Peanut just has trouble with curtains in general. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, so Chris is stealing and running away from home at this point, okay? Now, Chris's theft issues came about because he got into drugs. 
right, probably not hard to figure out, but and he needed money to fuel his drug habit. When Chris would run away from home, the police would usually find him in some like dingy rundown motel that was he was under the influence of whatever drug he could get his hands on. And then they would pick him up and take him home. Now, Chris didn't care who he stole from. It could be family, friends, businesses, you name it. If it was there, he would probably take it. Chris also had an anger problem. He'd get violent whenever he got really angry. He would attack his father. He would attack his friends. He would punch holes in the wall. You know, when he was angry, it always ended up in some physical, you know, altercation or physical act like punching a wall. Chris also had issues with lying because that usually comes along with criminal and drug activity, right? When police would be called to the family home by his dad because Chris was getting violent, Chris would try to twist the story around saying that his dad was the one actually beating him. On one of several occasions that the police came out to the home, Chris stated that his father had actually punched him like 20 times for no reason and then beat him with a belt. Now, police, of course, had to take this serious. So they asked Chris to pull up his shirt and show him, you know, like the injuries that he had. Well, Chris did, but there was no injuries, no evidence that Chris got hit at all, not even like red skin. This happened several times. And anytime he accused his father of beating him, there was never ev any evidence that Michael laid a hand on Chris. And unfortunately, Chris then grew up to just say that he was beaten as a kid by his dad. So in 2007, Chris would be 17 years old at this time. He decided to up his criminal game to Grand Theft Auto. So he broke into a business, stole a truck, and he drove it through the fence of the business to get away. Now he's caught for this pretty quickly. Uh, he's arrested, but since he's 17, they released him within a few days. 11 days after he's released from jail, he does the same crime again. He steals a car and he drives it through a security fence, but this time he almost runs over the security guard that is standing there. So he's caught, he's arrested, and again, he is released a few days later. Nine days after his release this time, he does it again, <laughs> you guys. He steals a car, he is caught, and a few days later, he's released again, okay? He's now done this three times, okay? Four days after he's released this time. So notice how it was like 11 days nine days. Now it's four days after he's released this last time. He breaks into a friend's home, steals some of his friend's belongings, steals the friend's car. So again, we're Grand Theft Auto again. And he is caught, arrested, and you guessed it, he was released again. <laughs> okay, so he is released on this latest Stealing the friend's car. The next day, y'all, the next day after his release, he steals another car. <laughs> is caught, is arrested, but this time he is not let go and not released. About damn time. In less than a month, five times he committed Grand Theft Auto and they finally say, you know what, we can't let you out. <laughs> It's like you're escalating. So he actually is sentenced to stay in prison until he turns 21. So he is now locked away. Okay, so let's move on to the mother, Courtney Bell. Now, Courtney Bell was born in 1993 to parents Tim and Pam. Now, Pam, she wasn't what I call a good mother. Now, throughout Pam's life, 
she would have seven children with five different fathers, and she would walk out on five of those children. Courtney, unfortunately, was one of those five children that she walked out on, leaving Tim, her father, to raise her by himself. Now, Courtney did not know who her mother was. It was something that wasn't really talked about. Tim didn't really say anything. I don't know the whole story of why her father wouldn't tell her who her mother was, but Pam would, was kind of around town. Like Tim would just explain Pam as an old family friend. And Courtney would run into Pam in the community and stuff, and they just have small chat. But she looked at Pam like, oh, she's just a friend of my father's. No big deal. Occasionally, Pam would show up to Tim's house, and they would have dinner together. Um, but again, you know, Courtney just saw Pam as a family friend, and they were just catching up. But in reality, Pam would only show up and have dinner with Tim when she needed help. She needed money, food, whatever. And Tim would help her out because, you know, that's his baby's mama. Eventually, Courtney figured out who her mother was. At age 12, Courtney was rummaging around in a car. She was after a cigarette. Why a 12-year-old should be smoking is another issue. But anyway, she found in the car some old stuff. And in that old stuff, there was her actual bracelet when she was a baby. Um, from the hospital and on that bracelet it listed Pam as her mother so that's how she found out Pam was her mom now when Courtney found this out she obviously wanted a relationship a mother-daughter relationship with Pam but Pam still wasn't interested in being a mom to Courtney and she kept her at arm's length and you know only would stick around to be that family friend. This obviously upset Courtney um, because she really didn't have like a female motherly type in her life. It was just her and her dad. And she also wasn't aware that she had these siblings out there either. This whole complicated relationship between her and Pam obviously caused, you know, some mental trauma. Okay, so let's jump to the year 2013 when Chris and Courtney first meet. Okay. Courtney is 20 years old and Chris was 23 years old. He had just gotten out of prison at age 21. Now to explain the family tree here, Courtney's mother, Pam, is Chris's dad, Michael, sisters. They're siblings. Okay. So Pam would be the biological aunt of Chris. And we already know Pam is the biological mother of Courtney. Now, their families never kind of met because Courtney's dad was, you know, raising her and, didn't, and she didn't know who her mom was. And Michael was having his own issues raising Chris. And it's not like they had these family reunions. It wasn't at the top of the list because Pam was kind of a drifter anyway. And she would only show up at Michael's house, her brother, to ask for money or food just like she did at Tim's. So, yeah they hadn't met, right? So Pam, of all people, like she was aware of her nephew, Chris. She knew Chris was Michael's son, everything. Okay. But anyway, for whatever reason, she's the one that introduces Courtney to Chris, but she never mentions to Courtney or Chris that they're cousins. So how exactly did this introduction go? Hey, Courtney, I got this great guy you should meet. Instead of, hey, this is your cousin Chris that you've never met. <laughs> like, how did this not come up in conversation? Now, there is some information later that comes out about Pam that may explain why Pam didn't, but we'll get to that. So stay tuned. We'll get to that. All right. So anyway... Chris and Courtney hit it off. Chris had stated that from their very first meeting, he knew he loved Courtney and Courtney apparently felt the same. So they start dating and they do not know they are first cousins at this point. Okay. Now, a couple months into dating, the timeline's kind of sketchy, but some point... <laughs> 
not too you know long after they start dating a family member which we, i think it was michael chris's dad tells them hey your first cousins like and not by marriage not like your biological first cousins so you might want to rethink this relationship but apparently the couple didn't care and they continued their relationship together. Chris has been quoted in saying that he can't help how his heart feels and he knows some people might find it sick, but it's not like they grew up together. <laughs> I'm sorry. I Side note, just a couple years ago, uh, I found out who my biological grandfather was. It'd been a 60 year mystery. Okay. Um, and of course, discovering that you discover a bunch of family, which a bunch of cousins <laughs> that I never knew that I had. Um, I never grew up with them. I never knew they existed. Um, but the fact that I know they are biological cousins kind of kills the idea of, hmm, should we date? I mean, I, but I guess, you know, that might just be me. Might just be me, but okay. Anyway, back on track. Chris and Courtney continued dating, and the family, especially Chris's dad, Michael, was pretty upset and horrified that, you know, his son was getting it on with his niece. So, but again, the couple didn't care. They just gave everyone the bird, ignored everyone, and continued their relationship. Now, it's not, it's not illegal to marry your first cousin in Georgia. This is where this takes place in Georgia. Did I say at the beginning? Sorry, if I didn't, it, this takes place in Georgia. So they could have gotten married if they wanted to, um, but they actually never legally got married. They just started telling people about after a year or so that they were husband and wife. So in 2015, uh, their first daughter, Clarissa, was born. Uh, Courtney had two goals regarding this child. One, to raise this child and be a good mother and have a good mother-daughter relationship, unlike what she had with Pam. Two, Courtney was hoping that Chris becoming a father would settle him down. You know, remember, he's still out there doing like criminal activities, drugs. I mean, he did state that he would do meth every day. He was violent towards Courtney. There was a lot of domestic issues. And big surprise, he was cheating on Courtney regularly. Now, Chris would set up secret social media profiles to talk to other women so Courtney wouldn't know what he was doing. You know, when the cops were investigating all this and looking into these profiles, there's also evidence that Chris was using one of these secret profiles to talk to Courtney's mom, Pam, <laughs> okay? And Pam was well aware that Chris, it was Chris she was talking to, okay? She knew Chris had these secret profiles to keep things from her daughter. So again, mom of the year, Pam, Jesus Christ. But the conversations that were going back and forth between Chris and Pam weren't exactly aunt-nephew type of talking. They got a little bit racy. Not outright, uh, but a little racy. Uh, there was also some questionable pictures that were posted to social media that you kind of go, mm, is that really an aunt-nephew kind of picture? <laughs> Now, Pam has denied any sexual contact with Chris. Uh, she actually was asked on the stand at the trial, and she denied that anything sexual happened between them. But, you know, it just makes you wonder, and why didn't you introduce them as cousins? Like, were you having a sexual relationship and you wanted to get rid of Chris, so you pawned him off on your daughter? Like, I don't know. There's just a lot of questions there that were never figured out. So, Clarice is born... And not too long after she was born, Chris had racked up um, a few arrest warrants and the police finally came a knocking on his door. Now, Chris is not the type to take responsibility for his actions and he fled from the police <laughs> and it ended up in a foot chase. 
And in the process of being chased, apparently Chris picked up a tree branch and hit the police officer across the face with it, which caused significant damage to like a pretty good gash on the officer's face. So they, you know, caught him, arrested him, and he actually spent 14 months in prison over this and his other charges. So Courtney, during this time, while Chris was in jail, had moved in with her dad, Tim, and actually was pretty stable. Um, Little Clarissa was flourishing. Uh, Courtney had gotten a job. Tim was helping take care of Clarissa. And Tim had even bought a car for Courtney so she could get around, you know. In September 2016, Chris is released from prison. And he now has all these face tattoos. Classy. Apparently, uh, those 14 months changed him in prison. And he decided that he wants to be a family man now. And uh, to do this, he wants to have another baby with Courtney. Why the hell not? Let's roll those dice again genetically, shall we? So by 2017, the couple is pregnant with their second child. And they end up moving into a trailer at a local trailer park. It's their first home together before they kind of lived with relatives and couch surfed. Courtney ended up quitting her job and she is now a stay at home mom. And Chris is getting odd jobs here and there to earn money for the family. Unfortunately, Chris still had a pretty bad drug habit, uh, specifically for meth. Courtney didn't appear to have a meth addiction. Um, but she did admit that she would partake in meth occasionally, but her choice of drug was mainly marijuana, apparently. So now due to, you know, the drug addiction, meth addiction, housekeeping really isn't a priority in most cases. And it was true with these two as well. Their trailer was dirty and cluttered. It was a two bedroom trailer. But there was so much junk and clutter and whatever have you in the second bedroom that Clarissa, the two-year-old at this point, had to sleep in the same room with Chris and Courtney. And she had this small little mattress that was shoved between Chris and Courtney's bed and the wall. So, you know, it's like hopefully that wasn't a long-term plan because Clarissa wasn't going to fit on that bed much longer. The domestic violence also continued. Courtney would show up with bruises, black eyes, and neighbors would say that the two screamed at each other all the time. Police were called out to the trailer on several occasions due to domestic issues, but Courtney and Chris have remained adamant that even though they had their issues, Chris never laid a hand on the children. So they're in the trailer. Everything's going splendidly if you want to call it that. Courtney's pregnant, but she goes into labor. Kalia is born a month early, premature, on September 23rd, 2017. She only weighed five pounds, but overall, she was a healthy baby. Everything was okay. However, this poor baby girl, she was not a priority for this couple from the start. So four days after Kalia was brought home from the hospital. Courtney takes the baby and her two-year-old Clarissa over to her cousin's house, you know, for a visit. You know, you want to see the new baby? Here, I'll bring him over. Great. So they're chatting in the living room, what have you, and Courtney's cousin actually goes into the other room to, to attend to one of her four children that she had. And while her cousin was in that other room, Courtney actually sneaks out of the house, leaving her newborn baby Kalia and her two-year-old Clarissa at her cousin's house and disappears for two days. Now, no one knows what happened to both Chris and Courtney because they both disappeared for those two days, but it was probably assumed it was a drug binge or something because why else would you disappear for two days like that? Now, Tim, Courtney's dad, finds out what Courtney had done, and he goes over to Chris and Courtney's trailer to confront them about leaving the kids with her cousin. Now, her car's there that Tim had bought her, so he figured they were there, but when he went into the trailer, they weren't there. 
And so Tim walks through the trailer just kind of looking for evidence of where would they be. But um, he notices that the trailer that's usually dust dirty and cluttered is worse than before. Like it's just trashed. There's just junk, trash, old food, clutter everywhere. So Tim actually gets the keys to Courtney's car and he takes it back to his house as punishment for what she has done. And so like, I'm taking the car back. You can't have it anymore because you can't be responsible. And then he goes over to Courtney's cousin's house and he gets baby Clea. Courtney's cousin agreed that she would watch the two-year-old Clarissa until Courtney could be found. So two days later, Courtney shows up at her cousin's house to collect her children. Surprise, I'm back. Sorry, I just had to, I needed a break. So Courtney's cousin tells her that Kalia is with your dad, okay? And for some reason, Courtney is furious about this. <laughs> like, <laughs> what the hell? You're mad because your dad came and got your kid. It wasn't that the whole point of leaving your kids with your cousin. Like, Jesus. Anyway, she's so furious, in fact, that she actually calls, Courtney calls 911 and reports that her dad kidnapped Clea. So the cops come out. Of course, they take it very seriously. She's saying he was, she, you know, her baby was kidnapped at this point, right? Well, fortunately, you know, this backfired on Courtney. And after, you know, the police kind of figured out what was going on and did the investigation, they stated that both Kalia and Clarissa would be better off living with their grandfather, Tim. And he was actually granted like temporary custody of both girls. So, of course, Courtney's like upset by this. And so is Chris. But Chris was more upset that Tim took the car. <laughs> not that Tim had temporary custody of the children. I mean, he was upset about that, but he was more upset about the car. Chris actually called Tim and tried to bargain with him at this point, saying that he'd sign over full custody of the children if you would just bring the car back. Now, I don't have children, but if I did, I think I would put my children above a car. But again, maybe that's just me. Now, Tim, being the good guy he is, this poor guy, he told Courtney, look, I'll bring the kids back, but you got to clean that trailer up and you have to make it, you know, get it tidy and have, make it appropriate to have kids in, you know. So Courtney agreed. And a couple days later, the trailer was kind of cleaned up. It wasn't all the way cleaned up, but she was working at it. You know, she was new at housekeeping. And Tim was satisfied with her progress. So he dropped off both children back at the trailer to Courtney and Chris. On the morning of October 7th, this would be about a week or so after the children were given back from Tim, a 911 call came in from Courtney. Courtney stated that she woke up at 10 a.m. and went to check on her children, and 15-day-old Kalia was missing from the trailer. Now, the thing about this 911 call is Courtney took a minute or two to, like, explain how she had two daughters, their ages, how she fell asleep on the couch, woke up at 10 a.m. She finally tells the 911 op operator, my daughter is missing. She tells them the actual problem. I mean, most people would be like... My baby is missing help and then fill in the details later, right? I mean, usually people don't start out with this big, long explanation and then tell them the issue. But again, that's just me. <laughs> now, Courtney stated that the last time she saw Kalia was 5 a.m. that morning when she had to change her diaper. Then she stated that both her and Chris had then fallen asleep on the couch in the living room. You know, she called family and friends to see maybe Tim came back and took the baby or something, but they stated they don't have the baby, and she's just looked everywhere. During the 911 call, she even calls out Kalia's name a couple times, like going, Kalia! Kalia! It's kind of weird and overdramatic, but, you know, she's a 15-year-old baby. It's not like she'd be like, over here, mom. You know, so anyway, that was kind of weird. But again, you know, when you're in a traumatic situation, you never know how you're going to act. 
So police arrive and they ask Courtney a bunch of questions about, you know, potentially where Kalia could be. And at one point, um, Courtney sort of blames her two-year-old. Uh, she states that she asked her two-year-old, what did you do with Sissy? And um, her daughter just replied, she's gone. Now, Chris isn't there when the police get there. And so they're like, well, where's the father? Where's Chris? Courtney states that he was out searching around their trailer seeing if Clea got outside. They eventually find him and he's wandering around the woods that surround the trailer park. Chris told police that he was searching the area for his baby daughter. Police found this strange because again, the baby isn't going to get up and walk. And even if Clarissa had something to do with taking the baby, Clarissa isn't going to walk it clear into the woods. They also find that Chris is immediately on the defensive. So they ask both him and Courtney to come into the police station and make a statement. Now, right away, before police can even ask a question to Chris, Chris starts explaining that he had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance. And he starts naming off these people that he has a beef with that could possibly be involved with taking his daughter. Obviously, Chris and law enforcement do not have a good relationship, right? So it could be understandable that Chris is automatically going to be like, I know you're going to blame me because of my past and the domestic issues and stuff like that. Now, Courtney said that both in her and Chris had fallen asleep on the couch after 5 a.m. after attending to their daughter. So if somebody was would take the baby, they would have had to walk past them sleeping, sleeping, we'll get into that later, on the couch, to get to the baby. Now, after questioning both Chris and Courtney, police did let them go, and then Chris and Courtney went back to the trailer to help search for their daughter. They search well into the night, and that evening, Chris and Courtney decide to go rest at her cousin's house, so they are fresh for, you know, to start in the morning to start searching. While at the cousin's house, the cousin stated the couple didn't seem like too bothered by what was going on. It was like they were just kind of chilling out at a friend's house. But, you know, grief affects everyone differently, right? Now, the next morning, the cousin got up and was surprised to find Chris and Courtney still sleeping on the couch and not out looking for their daughter. She woke them up, but she stated that they were like in no hurry to go search. It was just, it was just weird. Then, of all people, Pam, Courtney's mother, shows up at the cousin's house. Now, Pam had been doing her own thing for a while, you know, drifting, having more children, whatever she was into. And, um, you know, she hadn't seen Courtney for some time, but all of a sudden she shows up because she wants to help. Great, right? Pam wasn't there to like, let's go search for your daughter. Let's go, you know, your granddaughter, Pam. Let's go search for her. Let's do that. Pam was more interested because she knew that the couple had a TV interview with a local news station that morning, and she wanted to help them prepare for that. Again, way to go, Pam, mother of the year. So Chris, Courtney, Pam, and another friend named Lauren that was helping out got into Lauren's car and uh, they were heading back to the trailer park because the TV interview was supposed to take place there. On the way there, Courtney's phone rings and I'm not sure who the caller was. I'm assuming it was the police. They tell Courtney, Kalia has been found and to get to the trailer ASAP. Okay. Lauren stated that her and Courtney were almost like celebrating that the baby had been found and this sigh of relief kind of overtook them. And Lauren said she even started crying. But Chris, on the other hand, he wasn't celebrating. He was panicking. Now, the caller didn't say whether Kalia was alive or dead. Um, that didn't come till later. When Courtney announced to everyone in the car that Clea was found, Chris started freaking out apparently and saying, they're going to put this on me. They're going to blame me for everything. And he just wouldn't calm down. And Lauren stated he didn't even ask, is she okay? Is she alive? He just started freaking out. That's when Pam turned to Chris and states, run. 
what, Pam? What the hell? Your first instinct is not to celebrate that your daughter, your, your, your granddaughter has been found, hopefully alive, but instead is to protect Chris because he's freaking out, still thinks something wasn't going on between them two. Now, at this point, Chris literally jumps from the moving car when they were approaching a stoplight and just starts running in the opposite direction. <laughs> Lauren doesn't care. You know, she's she's driving. She just like closed the door. We're going to the trailer. He can do whatever the hell he wants. So they go to the trailer. Chris runs the other way. Now, once they get to the trailer, that's when they're told Kalia, unfortunately, did not survive. A search party member came across a log in the woods, not too far from the couple's trailer, and there were, like, sticks and leaves kind of placed around the log that looked too odd. Like, that wasn't a natural setting. The search party member used a stick to pull away the leaves, and she saw, like, a hole or an indentation beneath the log. In the hole indentation was a blue drawstring bag and Kalia's little body was inside the bag. Also inside the bag was some men's clothing and a blanket that Kalia was wrapped in. Courtney stated that the drawstring bag was Chris's and that Chris used that bag all the time and it went everywhere with him. And the clothes in the bag were Chris's also and she believed Chris was wearing those same units of clothing the night before Kalia's disappearance. Chris would say that the clothes were his, but he wasn't wearing them, that they had all these totes and everything around, and somebody must have grabbed him from the totes and wrapped Kalia in those clothes. There was an autopsy done on Kalia. This gets a little hard to hear, but bear with me here. Kalia suffered multiple injuries to the head and where there was multiple fractures, bruises, and her head was actually like odd shaped because of all of the injuries. There was a significant blood force trauma to the head and even to the mouth. Some of her baby teeth had actually fallen out. Now, when, you know, we're born, we actually have, you know, teeth that are up inside our skull and then they come down as baby teeth and then they're eventually replaced by the adult teeth, right? Well, she's only 15 days old, meaning these teeth were still up in the gums, in the skull. Some had fallen out due to the blunt force trauma that she suffered in her mouth area. They actually, they had to examine Clea's brain because of the blunt force trauma and where the soft, you know, skull tissue should have been when they peeled back her skin, the soft tissue was gone. It was just a hole exposing the brain. Then the brain itself uh, was pretty much liquefied due to the bleeding and the trauma that she went through. So Kalia's official cause of death was uh, blunt force trauma, uh, multiple blunt force traumas, and um, this was determined to be a homicide. Now, Courtney, Lauren, Pam are just told that Kalia didn't survive, and then that's when police noticed that Chris was not with the family, and they were like, um where's Chris? Where's the father? Again, this is feels like a broken record. Where's Chris? Lauren, the friend, explained that he had jumped from the car <laughs> and ran after the call came in about finding the baby because, you know, that's not suspicious at all. So it didn't take long for them to actually find Chris. They found him about two hours later. Uh, a call came in to 911 because there was a man in a gas station who was ranting and raving and yelling at the employee saying that he was innocent and he did not kill his baby daughter. Again, how did you get into a conversation about your dead daughter when the employee has no idea who you are? And you didn't even supposedly know that your baby daughter was dead because nobody told you yet. So now because of Courtney's statement about the, the bag and the clothes being Chris's, Chris was taken into custody and charged with murder while Chris was in jail and Courtney was out. There was, you know, phone calls between the two, which are obviously recorded. There's a couple phone calls where Chris and Courtney are yelling and fighting over the phone. Uh, 
I guess that's normal for them. But basically, Courtney, Courtney was pretty much asking him about, you know, evidence that they were finding that kind of pointed in Chris's direction and telling him, like, I think you did this. And um, but she never asks him outright if she did. And she always said that she was afraid of his answer. Now, through these phone calls, Chris adamantly denies hurting Kalia throughout this whole thing. Now, there was at one point where Chris found out that one of his friends that he does meth with was talking to the cops kind of as a witness. And then Chris asked to speak with investigators and then he blamed this friend (laughs) for uh, kidnapping and killing Kalia to get back at Chris. Now, I don't know if there was money owed or drugs owed or whatever, but that's basically what he was saying. But again, the problem was that somebody would have had to walk past both Courtney and Chris on the couch uh, sleeping, um, but we, uh, we will find out that Chris was not sleeping during that time to get to the baby. So it was just implausible that anybody else had anything to do with Clea's death and there was no forced entry or anything like that in the trailer found. Now, another incident that allegedly happened while Chris was in jail waiting trial, and this really has nothing to do with the trial itself or what he did, but it's just weird. So he was wearing what's called a turtle suit, which is something they put on prisoners who are on suicide watch. And he wasn't wearing any clothing underneath the turtle suit, which that's normal because it's to prevent, you know, any way for the prisoner to, you know, uh, hurt himself, themselves. So a woman psychologist came in to evaluate him and um, they were separated kind of by like a glass pane. But the psychologist stated that Chris stood up lifted up his turtle suit to uh, present his penis and proceeded to masturbate to completion in front of her. So, yeah. Anyway, law enforcement in their investigation determined that Courtney was potentially involved in Kalia's death disappearance as well because Courtney did admit that her and Chris did some meth the night before Kalia disappeared. So Courtney was arrested three months after Chris for second degree murder. In May of 2019, that is when the trial began. They tried the couple together um, and the trial lasted about a week. Many witnesses were called, family, friends, a woman Chris was allegedly having sex with at the time, and of course, Pam. Pam. Pam was on the stand. She, you know, had to get her 30 seconds of fame in there. Now, the trial was confusing at times. Um, Everyone said something different. (laughs) And you never knew who was lying and who was telling the truth. I mean, you know, and I, I mean, I know that's most trials, but it's like this one was really like, wait, what? The trial footage is on YouTube all days. Um, You can view it for yourself. I, I The link is in my resources in the description box below. It's crazy, and it is hard to follow sometimes, so just a warning there. (laughs) Now, police were able to determine, based on the timeline that they had, that Chris was the last person to see Kalia alive because they determined that Chris was awake between the hours of 5 a.m. and 10 a.m., not sleeping like he said he was. Now, they know this because between the hours of 5 a.m. and 10 a.m., he was busy on his social media accounts, posting pictures and talking to other women. So, yeah, it's going to be really odd for someone to sneak in the trailer when he wasn't really sleeping. Now, Chris was convicted and given life in prison with no possibility of parole for the murder of his daughter. During sentencing, Chris was more concerned about telling the court that he did not masturbate in front of that psychologist, that his suit, his turtle suit, didn't fit properly, and the Velcro was, like, bad. It wouldn't stick, and it just popped open, and it just casually showed his penis, and he closed it up real quick. Yeah, accidentally showing your penis and masturbating to completion... I mean, they're pretty much the same thing, right? (laughs) 
I mean, but why would the psychologist lie? Like, it has nothing to do with the case. It's just weird behavior. But after he tried to explain the whole masturbation issue thing away, only then did he continue to maintain his innocence for killing his daughter. So... Again, priorities, dude. Like, seriously. As for Courtney, she was initially found guilty for second-degree murder, and she was given 30 years in prison. However, she did appeal, and in February 2022, Courtney's conviction was overturned due to lack of evidence, and she was set free. Now, Chris tried to do the same thing, um, but all of Chris's appeals have been denied thus far. Police were never able to really tell the story of like motive of what really happened. So there were they were just going on, you know, theories, circumstantial evidence and beliefs because there was actually no evidence that anything happened in the trailer nor out in the woods because with the blunt force trauma, the baby really didn't have any blood. So a lot of people, of course, have their own theories in this case. So the most obvious theory and the one presented at the trial was that Chris killed Kalia in a fit of rage, which we know his rage and violence tendencies, especially if he was on meth that night and that morning. Another theory, and this one was interesting, is that Courtney killed Kalia, whether it was on purpose or accident, while on a drug binge, you know, and purposely used Chris's belongings to frame him. Some people say that those recorded phone calls between her and Chris uh, while he was in jail was an act or like a performance put on by Courtney to further make herself, you know, look as a distraught mother and put all the guilt solely on Chris. So I thought that was an interesting theory as well, because there are, if you watch the trial, Courtney has some certain facial expressions sometimes or some smirks that you kind of go, should you be doing that during that? You know, it's, it's just weird. But anyway, now the final theory is that they both were responsible for whatever happened and tried to cover it up by thinking no one would find, you know, the log and underneath and that it would just become a cold case and eventually go away. Unfortunately, we may never know what really happened. So, kids, the moral of this story. Be a productive member of society. Don't be a criminal. Keep away from those drugs that will ruin your life. And don't screw your biological family members. Can we just stop doing that? (laughs) Now, in another video I did about uh, Kevin Plattel and his daughter that ended up having a baby together, I'll put the card up for you. There is a psychological phenomenon called genetic sexual attraction. This is when biological family members meet as adults because they were, you know, either adopted out as children um, or in the case of Chris and Courtney, their families just never met. And upon meeting their biological family member for the first time, a physical attraction develops. This could be one-sided or they both can be attracted to each other. It can be um, an instantaneous upon meeting or it can develop over time as the individuals are getting to know each other. It's not considered rare, (laughs) but considered uncommon. Now, some experts in psychology do consider this pseudoscience and have tried to debunk it, saying that there are other underlying reasons why someone be attracted to their biological family member, which could include past trauma or, you know, just the strong feeling to be accepted, included into, you know, whoever you're talking to. And so the line gets blurred and sometimes then crossed because they they just don't have a better way of knowing how to deal with those feelings. But there are counselors out there that specialize in genetic sexual attraction. So it's definitely happening more than we'd like to think. And even in the cases of, you know, adopted families, because a lot of, you know, if you're an adoptee or an adopter, there's a lot of counseling that goes on. They actually warn you about this and tell you that it's normal. So 
take it as you want there. So what do you think about this case? Do you think one, both, or neither of them had anything to do with Clea's death? Please let me know in the comments down below. And thank you for those that are sticking with me. I will try to put YouTube back up on the priority list because I know um, I really appreciate the feedback and interaction I get with you guys. So thank you for tuning in. I hope everyone has a great Christmas and New Year's holiday, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.